If I could drill down on the commitment to Paris, because I think over the weekend this whole debate uh, just kind of uh, resurfaced this question around the coalition, whether you are, you know, really committed to Paris and net zero by 2050. You say you won't pull out of an international agreement, you'll stick to that. But I guess there's questions from voters around whether you really want to do it or whether you're just, you know, there in name only, if you like. Well, well, we wouldn't commit to nuclear energy if we didn't believe in making those international commitments. We're saying that our coal-fired power stations will transition. And sadly, uh, it was Chris Bowen and a couple of newspapers that, that took up the headline without actually drilling into the facts. Uh, and that's disappointing that a journalist in the gallery would, would actually have a headline to say that we've blown up Paris Agreement. We didn't. There was never the comment that Peter Dutton made. It was disingenuous uh, for that media outlet to make that as a headline in their paper on the, on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, the reality is we are living up to international commitment. We're making a commitment to achieve that through different means, by firming up our energy grid with reliable baseload power that'll keep manufacturing going. Because Batteries and wind turbines won't keep smelters going, won't keep manufacturing going in this country. And you've got to be honest with the Australian people. And this has a longer payback of 80 to 100 years, whereas our renewable energy, you'll be turning them over every 20, every 20 years at best to mm. keep up with what we'll be making in that, in that commitment. So we'll be honest, we'll be upright and, and, and forthright with the Australian people about how we're going to achieve that. We haven't walked away from that. We're okay. just saying that this linear pathway that they're trying to achieve is why you're experiencing increased energy bills, increased food bills, increased mortgage rates because inflation's staying mm. higher longer because we're not addressing the fundamentals. If we could sound that honesty um, note for a moment, uh, David, I think if I could play devil's advocate here, that journalist has looked at, you know, how long it would take nuclear to ramp up in Australia and, you know, say obviously, well, something's got to fulfil that commitment. So even if you say in the long term nuclear would bring down emissions, in their short term, would there, would, would there be a spike under this plan? No, what we're saying is that we won't have a linear pathway. There will be a ramp up at the end in us achieving that mm -hmm. goal of, of net zero by 2050. So what we're saying is we need to do it what's in the best interest of Australia, not what's in the best interest of Mike Cannon-Brooks and, and Homes Accord, who might have big investment in renewable projects. I mean, they come to this with self-interest. Uh, what you're going to see in our energy policy is one that has a mix of renewables uh, with gas and carbon capture storage, which is zero emissions in the Biden mm -hmm. administration has pumped $1.2 billion into carbon capture storage. We'll need to do that as well. And then what we want to do is transition those coal-fired power stations, some of those, across to a nuclear power plant. That's the common sense solution. Yeah. We'll be upfront and honest about our energy mix. And we've got 12 months to election. And you'll see that well before the next election in terms of what we're proposing and our commitment to meeting our international treaty uh, that we've signed up. Because if we don't, your interest rate could be up as high as three percent extra and you could see a, a tariffs put on our commodities and for our farmers we don't want to see that but we think there's a sensible solution in achieving it we just don't need to achieve it by 2030 which is what this mob's trying to do sure. if you were to achieve nuclear and that long-term mission of bringing down new, um, emissions with nuclear in the mix what would happen to renewables under your plan? Would renewables, wind and solar stay on the same trajectory as, as labour at the moment? Or would you need to, um, you know, move around those subsidies a bit? Move subsidies from yeah, no, no, we're not, renewables and yeah. move them to, over to nuclear or hydrogen or whatever it is? Yeah, well, we won't be going hydrogen. That's a pipe dream that's only going to line uh, mm. Twiggy Forest Pocket. Uh, <laughs> well, what is, we have said is we're not of a going pipe to 82 than nuclear, though, considering we don't have an industry here yet. No, because nuclear works in many countries around the world, and yeah. Japan's moving back into well, nuclear well, energy. In fact, about works, to build another 1,200. But it's just too expensive to work, basically. It, yeah, and, and I think what people in the city forget and our Teal friends forget is that in achieving all this, you have to destroy <laughs> our livelihoods in regional Australia. They want to put their head on a pillow in Wentworth and Warringah 
and so yeah the regional Australia can bear all this but they forget about the prime agricultural land that's been ripped up people's livelihoods that have been taken away but they also forget the natural environment that's been destroyed now if they want wind turbines in their backyard it's good luck mm. to them okay. but we've got to be honest about this and we can achieve this but there is a place for renewables and I believe the best place for renewables that are in an environment it can't destroy which is on rooftops mm. where the concentration of power and the concentration of population is so there will be a, a renewables mix is part of our grid okay. but we won't be going to an all renewables approach and we won't be going to 82 percent renewables because we're going to have to keep subsidizing manufacturing and keep it alive in this country and Australians can't afford that.